Welcome back to Wake Up with Nubian Tigers Talk, a podcast brought to you by a group of Black Princeton alumni. Our podcast explores real issues affecting our Black and Brown communities. My name is Michelle Jacobs, and I'm here with my co-host, Ray Smalls. Ray, can you believe this is our second season? No, I cannot, Michelle. (laughs) I'm just happy we got through 2020, quite frankly. (laughs) I know, that's right. And when you look at it, so much has happened just since our last show in December. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We've got uh, the resurgence of COVID-19 with um, three new mutant strains. Yeah, I lost track after one. Right. Um, We've got a poor vaccine rollout. Mm -hmm. That shows yet again, Black folks and others of color are not getting access to the medical services as Mm -hmm. less than, I think, maybe nationally, it's about 10% of the Black population has gotten access. Well, in some areas, it's like less than 5%, Michelle. Right. I know in New York, it's it's around, it's hovering around five. Yep. Yep. Uh, So that's not very hopeful. (laughs) (laughs) Well, on a personal note, um, my uh, my mother, who's been in a nursing home for since March, uh, well, she was in a nursing home before that, but we have not seen her since March, not been able to touch her or hug her or, or, or anything one-on-one. Um, she's gotten both vaccinations. So at least now we have a feeling of, okay, uh, our mom's protected because, you know, it's just been over these months, we've just been worried. Um, People have been dying at her nursing home left and right. And, you know, we were just praying that she wouldn't get infected. And and fortunately, our prayers were answered. Well, that's good. And hopefully you'll be able to see her soon and give her a big hug and kiss and let her know she's well loved um, and has been missed during this time. And it's uh, interesting to note that just recently in the news, uh, I think maybe even uh, Friday, the uh, turns out that Governor Cuomo in New York uh, hit the numbers of people who were dying in nursing homes. You know, whatever happened to the buck stops here, right? I mean, he's got his assistant, Mr. Rosa, taking the blame for it. Now, I mean, honestly, whatever aspirations he had politically after he's done w- with his uh, governorship in New York, it's over, Michelle. It's done. His political career is toast. As well as should be. Yes. <laughs> And then we can't even start talking about the fact that white folks tried to overthrow the government (laughs) by attacking the Capitol Uh, on January 6th. I I watched that whole thing as it went down live, right? Because, because, you know, I'm I'm home now. I I haven't been traveling. And when that thing went down, I am just, you know, my, my wife, Terry, and I were looking at each other like, this isn't a movie, right? I mean, we're not, we're not watching some, you know, sci-fi, you know, movie where people were infected with some sort of, uh, you know, disease, and this is what happens to them. No, no, these were actual people storming the castle, right? I mean, it's they were storming the castle, and they were they didn't care who they stepped on, who they. I mean, Michelle, they were stabbing people with the flagpoles that they were bringing to the march. Right. You know, Ray, I was uh, have been thinking about the events a lot, and we always expect white folks to use violence against Black people. That's nothing new. We're mm-hmm. accustomed to that. Mm-hmm. But it was really something to see them attack their own people, yeah. including police mm-hmm. officers, mm-hmm. by beating them with flagpoles that still had the American flag attached to it. Now, that was, that was a visual I'll remember for quite a long time. I'll, I'll go one better. They were beating the Capitol Police with flags that said, Blue Lives Matter. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, it's amazing when you think about it. And yeah. hopefully uh, this season, we'll have some opportunities to talk about that more yeah. in depth with, yeah. uh, with hopefully a guest or two. Well, and, and, and before you finish... Mm. I mean, okay, so they're now going to go through an impeachment with him, right? And now we're going to sit down and see where the rubber meets the road, whether the Republicans are going to condone this type of of uh, insurrection or whether they're not. Oh, well, we already know the answer to that, but <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, let's not do a spoiler. <laughs> okay, okay. By the time this airs, we'll all know that business as usual prevails. Yeah, and and I would have already gotten my uh, gun license or in order. (laughs) 
Well, today we're going to be looking at the issue of environmental racism's impact on health outcomes for Black people. Our guest today is Dr. Cheryl Holder. Dr. Holder is board certified in internal medicine and has dedicated her medical career to serving underserved populations. As medical director of Jackson Health Systems North Dade Health Centers, she developed an HIV care and treatment program with funding through the Ryan White Care Act. Dr. Holder participated in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and National Institute of Health Advisory Programmatic Review Panels for HIV Treatment and Vaccine Research. She is currently at Florida International University, Herbert Weidheim College of Medicine, where her focus is on teaching medical students about working in underserved communities and pro promoting diversity in the health professions through pipeline programs. She's a tiger from the class of 1980. So Dr. Holder, welcome to the show and thank you so much for coming. We're so excited to be able to talk to you about the uh, environmental issues that you're gonna be talking about today. So we wanted to just start by asking you if you can give us an idea of some of the toxic uh, things that we're exposed to in, in various different black communities. Um. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And I am, I have to tell you, I'm new to environmental justice compared to how many years it's been go ongoing. Because I entered into this around 2016 through the climate change world and the impact of climate on health. And as a black physician, the National Medical Association has been very much aware of all the environmental hazards that has impacted the black communities for many, many years and working a lot with the NAACP. So the NMA has a, um, a subcommittee that addresses environmental issues. And that subcommittee has also now expanded into climate. And so with some of my initial work on the environmental, in particular, we started with mercury in dental fillings. Oh. Um, which is in much more impactful, especially as in dental fillings, the Medicaid population, they would continue to use mercury fill fillings in the Medicaid population, where mercury fill, the silver fillings, have been removed from most richer communities, most white kids, no, no one gets mercury filled fillings, yet they continue to use it in the Medicaid population. Mm. Cost is not an issue. There's supposedly that it lasts longer than the white fillings and the non-mercury loaded fillings, but the data does not support that. So the National Medical Association, we have been fighting that dental amalgam must no longer be used in the Medicaid population. And the cost is not significantly different. I mean, it's the same price. What so is the health we, risk of having mercury in the dental filling? In younger people, especially children, you have the long-term IQ losses, oh. in brain injury, the nervous system, and that will lead to learning disorders and delay in um, progress. And in a society where education is key to your success, we are setting up a large number of black kids, especially poor kids, to poor functioning in school. So it's as toxic as lead then. It is as toxic as like lead and also the implications of malignancies and other kidney disease. Mm. But the main issue is that it happens in such a young age that it's the duration and the small doses. So they say the doses isn't significant, but if you start from age three, four, and this builds on the problem we see with poorer kids who get poor access to proper nutrition have more sugar drinks, so they have cavities earlier. And so they're starting with this slow ex exposure to low level of mercury for a lot longer time. And so that's really the danger. Wow, and, that's, that's fascinating. I didn't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah, dental amalgam is really one of the biggest source of toxicity in our poor children of mercury. It's not the fish, it's not the sardines, which you often hear about for pregnant women. Um, it is really the dental fillings that are being used disproportionately in poor communities. 
Okay, so, you know, one of the things that prompted us to reach out to you, um, to have you on the show, was this whole discussion about the Flint, Michigan water settlement. Um, and, you know, the just the callous way in which the public officials disregarded the health impact of lead in, in their water. So we, we pretty much know about lead poisoning, but what are some of the other uh, toxins like lead that might be in an environment that would cause uh, health problems for our communities? Um, right now, any of the pollutants that comes out of fossil fuels, um, any of the plastics, the BPAs and the endless number of plastics that are in our, in especially the microplastics that's in our water, there's arsenic, there's lead, there's mercury, there's, I don't even have a long list of names that are in our water supply. Now, the problem with older cities is that the piping is where a lot of the seepage comes from. And so when you have older pipes, which is what happens in Flint and many of the older cities, that's where the contamination is. And the municipalities which have not invested in maintaining proper infrastructure, you're going to see the leakage of all these chemicals. Now, the exact names, again, that's not my specialty in knowing the exact names. And I tell my patients and I tell everyone, at this point, when we start getting caught up too much in whether it's this or whether it's that, then you're going to get the EPA and everyone telling you, but it's only this little amount at this little amount and safe levels. And there truly are not safe levels when you look at babies or children. When you look at if our life expectancy goes over to 80, it is no longer you're just getting exposed and you're dead at 50. You're looking at very long-term exposure if you're gonna stay in these communities. So the real issue comes back to our infrastructure needs to be invested in. And an even bigger issue is the disinvestment in our public health infrastructure because places like Flint and many of the other cities are able to ignore these issues because there's minimal monitoring of many of these waters and the monitoring is insufficient to capture all the data and to show the dangers because most of the government agencies in the health departments are no longer funded to the level to be able to, to find the degree of contamination and the amount of testing that's required. Because it took for the, the people from lead to say they've reported many times their water color, the smell, it was reported, but it was ignored. It wasn't until the physician started noticing and then made a really big plea that the, the people in Flint were listened to. So it goes beyond environmental racism, where it's just plain old disregard and devaluing of a population as populations speak up for themselves. And then a lack of a public health infrastructure. The way it plays out in Florida is the public health infrastructure is so not invested in that we, it took a Zika crisis, which is a, um, a mosquito-borne infection, mm -hmm. for them to fund the mosquito control system in Dade County. Mm -hmm. They had decrease the department to such a level that there was no one monitoring the mosquito problem in Florida. In and South how many Florida. people passed away until that was done? Oh, I don't have the exact numbers, but the more thing that happened that brought their attention was a total shutdown of the tourist industry right. for several areas. Right, so not the death so, of the, not the death, citizens no, the of the community, yeah. it was right. the tourism that the got tourism. there. Got it is Florida bus. she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it is Florida. It is Florida. <laughs> right. They right. never publicize, they never monitor the deaths. They don't really keep those numbers. But um, when whole neighborhoods were shut down, what they depend on, that's when they funded and actually brought in a mosquito control person to lead the department and hired more people to monitor. It's just like the beaches. You should monitor the amount of bacteria in your water parasites and those things have been so defunded that there's not much monitoring. So when you look at the data, you don't see a problem because it's not detected. And when the population speaks up, that's 
suffering from it, they often ignore it. So mm -hmm. there's a huge impact economically. It's like what happened with our mosquito problem. It's the only reason Florida paid attention. Mm -hmm. In Flint and other cities, um, we are going to have more and more repeat of this because the infrastructure has not been repaired and been invested in. So Dr. Holder, I wanna ask you about what are the, um, what are uh, especially black and brown communities more susceptible to if they live in a, in a rural area, more rural area, let's say next to a waterway, a river, a creek or whatever, versus let's say a metropolitan city, like maybe not one as old as Flint, but as large as like Chicago or New York or Baltimore, well, or what, some places like that. Well, what we know that the environmental damage affects Blacks regardless of socioeconomic status. The, when you look at the rates, Black people, rich, poor, middle, are all exposed to more environmental toxins than white people. I think the rate of almost one and a half to twice as much. So it doesn't matter rich or poor, the Black communities tend to be closest to some sort of environmental hazard. So you'll hit in Louisiana, the, we call those the fence line communities. They'll be near all those oil rigs and all those areas. You get into the, the corridor, the Northeast, they'll be next to the coal mine, next to the, to the highways. When you're in North Carolina in the rural areas, they'll be next to hog farms and rivers that are polluted and there's no cleaning. You get into East Oakland, California, and you hear Oakland, what happened prior to that, much of the, the infrastructure and the manufacturing deposited a lot of their toxins in the ground. But with sea level rise, which is the same thing as happening in South Florida, with sea level rise, as the water comes up, it moves the buried toxins and moving it into the water table. Mm. Now, places along the coast, especially in the black and brown communities, which has always been, because not in my backyard politicians, will relegate most of the hazardous areas to poor people. In Sarasota, outside of Tampa area, there's a community they call Progress Village. In the, whenever I-4, 75 corridor went in about 40, 50 years ago, they moved out a whole community and then put them next to a toxic, um, old manufacturing toxic gum. And then they named it Progress Village. So when you are disenfranchised and structural racism, you end up in areas where they're powerless to be able to make the vote to not be moved or not have the cheaper housing right where the environmental hazards What's interesting in Florida, where in South Florida, anywhere in Florida, if you look, most of the railroad tracks, that's where they put the poor communities because Florida is a typical Jim Crow state that was developed for Jim Crow legislation. And since the coast was where white folks lived and the desirable property, they would put all the black folks by the railroads. So they were always exposed to toxins, but now railroad tracks, are the highest grounds in Florida. Mm. Railroads are built on solid ground, the most solid rock you can find. So with climate change, we're now finding they're coming in to take over these communities, which were the least desirable communities, moving the poor people from high ground and moving them into low ground. Mm. Which mm -hmm. now they'll be very much affected by sea level rise. But low ground, they're not moving them toward the water. <laughs> they're, they're, moving, no, no. No. they're moving them to homestead. Right. Yeah. You don't get yeah. it. You don't get a chance to you go to the beach. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. The Army Corps of Engineers came in with billions and billions of dollars to protect the the coast. So again, you're looking at poor people being in the worst environmental hazardous areas. And then the, the long-term effect of exposure to all the chemicals, whichever one they will be, um, the, whether it's pollutant particles in the air or the water or the chemicals, the heavy metals, all of those um, are relegated to these poorer communities. And then lack of improvement in the infrastructure. So even if you fix anything, the pipes in your houses 
have the corrosion and continue to have the, the poisoning. I saw recently, I don't think it was in the United States, but I think it's the first child death that has been officially attributed to asthma. Uh, and I know within our own group, we have uh, some, of, some of the Nubian tigers who uh, have experienced adult onset asthma. So uh, I saw something that said the car um, fumes and truck fumes and all of that have uh, contributed to that. So what, what, can, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, blacks, and, blacks and of course brown have the highest rates of asthma in this country, especially black children. And when they look at his exposure to particle 2.5, those are the tiny ones, which comes from transportation. Transportation is the leading pollution carbon use in this entire country. So when you look at the transportation industry and transportation, again, where is housing? Where are the schools? Where are the communities that are next to highways? That's where you see what we see. And so when you look at lung asthma, and now we've seen even the pollution linked to premature births, we also see linked to coronavirus, having worse coronavirus outcome, because those particles, the, um, especially with coronavirus, it's really tiny. So what it does is hop onto other particles. And so when it hops onto other particles, then you get a bigger amount. So if you're in an environment that has a lot of these polluted particles in the air, and then the coronavirus, it's more likely that the coronavirus will hop onto these particles and get you infected. Mm. I see, I will, cause I have that down as a question for you <laughs> because yeah. I'm trying to understand what the connection would be between like asthma. Um, I think, you know- um, Wait a minute, it's, it's two words, sounds like. <laughs> Dr. Janice Herbert yeah. uh, came in and she was and telling us about the uh, connections between diabetes, for example, and uh, the, high blood pressure and COVID. Um, and oh, then I saw this, this little piece that says something about asthma. So I was mm -hmm. uh, curious as to how, what, what the interaction of that would be. Well, it's the pollution and the data, it came out of um, Chan in public health up at Harvard. They did the study and they showed that the part of anyone who's in the higher particle 2.5, that's the tinier ones that comes out with all the pollution and from your exhaust, the death from COVID was higher. And so we know that the COVID-19, and it makes, it's just makes perfect sense. You, the, what we find with coronavirus, the dose of the virus that you get leads to the worsen of your severity of disease. So if you get a higher dose, inhale a higher dose, you will have more severe disease. Mm -hmm. So when you have a higher polluted area, especially with those particles, and you get exposed to that, there's a higher percentage of the virus that will be on these particles, so you're gonna get a higher dose. So of course it makes sense that you have worse severity and death. Plus your underlying lung is not as strong because you've had long-term exposure. And especially if you've had asthma from childhood. Now childhood asthma, um, because it's not well treated, again, out of poverty and poor access to good care, it ends up causing damage. Asthma itself is supposed to be what we say reversible. So you tighten up a little bit, then you're supposed to get normal. With asthma untreated or continually exposure to all the allergens and the pollution, it ends up causing long-term lung damage. So it's not a reversible disease. So you have children who has asthma who go into adulthood with poor lung function or poorer than the person brought up in healthy conditions. Then coronavirus comes, they get a high dose of the coronavirus infection on the bad lung and you have high death. Mm. So that's what we saw in the data with exposure to environmental to the pollution and the death rate being higher. And are those people more than likely the first ones that have to be put on ventilators if they come in with COVID symptoms? Their lung function would be worse. So they will do worse with all the other measures to try and prevent getting on a ventilator. It, it's the compounding, compounding. of racism, right? Yes. I, I'm talking with some engineers trying to make them more aware of how their engineering decisions 
mm-hmm. contribute to environmental racism, right? So even there, I think it's Liberty City that was divided by the highway. So <laughs> it cut straight yeah. through those Overtown. black communities. Overtown. Overtown, right, right, yeah. right. And that, that uh, was replicated all over the United States, wherever the there was black communities. Well, that's not in my backyard laws. Mm-hmm. Mm. Highway was proposed to be further west. And all the rich folks said, oh, no way you're putting a highway here. Of course. Black folks said, oh, wait, no way you put a highway. They're like, oh, is there a community in Overtown? Mm. Mm. It's, again, racism. Mm-hmm. Right. When you look at the and the areas that are redlined, I mean, it goes just so far back. We end up with this problem now. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think in New York, they even uh, Robert Moses, which mm-hmm. everyone oh my knows, gosh. He, he was clear on that. No, you know, yeah. if you got to destroy that black community, go ahead, because we yes. want right. the suburban right. white right. <laughs> commuters right. to have an easier way uh, into the city. And he was, they were all very clear about that. Mm. Yeah. But Central Park was built. Yes. The community was moved out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's all over. I mean, that's what happens in racism. Be sure to stay tuned for part two of our conversation about environmental racism and how it impacts black health outcomes with Dr. Cheryl Holder from Florida International University. If you enjoyed what you heard today, visit our website, NubianTigersPodcast.com. In addition to the podcast, we also post a resource page for each subject to provide additional sources of information. Follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Nubian Tigers, written as one word. We're on YouTube on the Nubian Tigers podcast channel. Have a favorite podcast service? Well, we're probably on it. So just subscribe and look for us under Nubian Tigers Talk. Looking forward to sharing some knowledge with you next time. Wake up, wake up, wake up.